Okay, it's 10 uh, central time. So thank you, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Energy Now, for uh, having us. Uh, we are part of the LoRa Alliance, and we're going to be presenting on the LoRa uh, technology. So, and, uh, and the title of today's presentation is LoRa One, a digital revolution for oil and gas. Uh, presented by the Smart Industry Work Group uh, from the Laura Alliance. So I will be the moderator. My name is Philippe Daru. Um, uh, I'm a member of the Laura Alliance. I'm the vice president of the Smart Industry Work Group for uh, the Laura Alliance. I also work at Chevron. And we have some uh, very, very good uh, panelists with us today, uh, Robert Ward. Uh, with Multitech, Frank Gellison from Aloxi, uh, John Polly from Chevron, Barney Barnowski from uh, Tectelic, and Kevin Zando from Yokogawa. And uh, they will give us a, a lot of good feedback about LoRaWAN and its application for the oil and gas and uh, use cases. So in the agenda today, uh, first we're gonna start with the LoRa Alliance overview. Uh, mainly what is the Laura Alliance and uh, how it can help uh, you guys uh, uh, to support your environment. Uh, then we'll dig a little bit deeper on the technical side with the Laura One standout and a few oil and gas use cases to consider. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll move to the, to the panelists. Uh, and uh, the first one will be from Multitech. It's going to give us an overview uh, and a better idea of the delivery model that Multitech uh, is using. Uh, next, we're going to go with Yoko Gawas, uh, and we'll be more centered about the IT OT space and how they are merging, and uh, a little bit more detail as well on their sushi sensor that can be used uh, in our environment. Uh, after that, we're going to have Tectelic uh, that will give us also information on their product and their offerings for the Adardus area location. And then Aloxy will give us information on their valve monitoring system and what it can do for you. Finally, uh, uh, we're going to have a presentation on uh, a LoRa One example use case done by Upstream Chevron. And uh, we plan on having about 15 to 10 minutes uh, left at the end for QA. But feel free to use the chat uh, of the QA um, within the tools to ask questions. Uh, we're going to try to keep on looking at it. Uh, and uh, some of the panelists will be able to answer while we do the presentation. So here is a LoRa Alliance overview. So the LoRa Alliance is an open non-profit association of members. It was launched in 2015, and it's really focused on a, a LP1, low power wide area network, uh, and promoting the LoRa One protocol. So um, the LoRa Alliance main, develop and maintain global open specification. I think here what's important to, to look at is an open, uh, we really want in you know, oil and gas most of the time to stay with open standards. Um, and it also helps getting certification on the devices. So if you go to the website from the Lower Alliance, there's a section dedicated uh, where you can look at uh, which equipment has already been reviewed by the Lower Alliance, which means it will follow the LoRa standard and can be used uh, 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 with any gateways and, and uh, network server that follow uh, the LoRa Alliance uh, and the LoRa One standard. So this slide is a bit busy, but it provides a good uh, overview of uh, all the members and the contributors to the LoRa Alliance. Uh, you can see that it goes from sponsor to contributors to adopters, uh, and it's been growing pretty, pretty fast. And so if you are not a contributor to the LoRa Alliance or a member of the LoRa Alliance, please feel free to go and checked for you if there's any anything. And I think there's a lot of good information on that website. Uh, as you can see, uh, the LoRa, uh, LoRa One networks currently support a lot. I'm getting some information, let me move that. Uh, covers a lot of uh, countries so far, uh, 161 countries and uh, 143 different LoRa One network operators. Uh, so it's an uh, ever-growing uh, capability. There's a lot of work being done in that space and uh, uh, with the members. So 
So the LoRa ecosystem, uh, if you look at it, the LoRa, uh, uh, LoRa one starts from the chip, the chipset, which is manufactured and, and built by Semtech. It goes into modules, and those modules provide capabilities, so they can provide uh, different input outputs and, and sending data. Uh, the global information is all sent wirelessly over the air. Uh, so with a module, you can create some devices. The devices send the data over the air to the gateways. And the gateways, that's where you have an interface, which is Ethernet. And then you can put it on your network and it goes to server to do analytics uh, and operators to, to, to develop their own application to support uh, their sensors. And it can be done on-prem or in the cloud. Uh, to provide you solutions. And uh, if need be, there are some system integrators that can help you go from, uh, I would say, the, the sensor all the way to the application in, in your environment. So you don't have to reinvent everything for you if you never touch it or, or if you want some help. So right now, there are uh, six different uh, verticals that uh, Laura Alliance is looking at. Uh, smart cities, building automation, industrial IoT, utilities, agriculture, and asset tracking. And this is really looking at what the capabilities of the sensors and, and the ecosystem that can support you in that space. Uh, there are more than, there are millions of LoRaWAN connected device uh, worldwide, as you can you could see on the previous slide, 164 countries. So it's a lot of uh, location. And there, are, there are a lot of different new capabilities that are uh, put together every year to, to support the environment. So it is more of a technical uh, uh, review of what is the LoRa One in terms of, uh, if you think about it, very similar to the iOS uh, OSI layer, uh, where you go from layer one to layer seven. It's about the same thing on the LoRa One, except it's a bit smaller in terms of layers because uh, it's a simplified environment. So it's really a, a standard made for LP1 technology, low power, wider area network. Um, so. What it provides you is low data rate, uh, but very wide coverage area for IoT device. It's uh, leveraging uh, sub gigahertz frequencies. So in the ISM band, industrial, scientific, and medical. Uh, it provides bi-directional acknowledged communication, very simple start network technology. Uh, it can provide localiz localization, geolocation, uh, but it's not never gonna be as good as, as a GPS or, UWB, but it's good to know that it exists as well. Uh, really, the, the main point is that the sensors and gateways are very low cost, uh, designed for long battery life. So the, the, the big advantage is that you can put sensor in your environment uh, that uh, can stay for five, six, seven, up to 10 years uh, uh, on battery. Uh, it's secure because it follows the 802.15.4 AS128. And for example, uh, because of that, RF link budget of 154 dB for the US, uh, you can understand that it can support either very large coverage or help you on the penetration when you have a lot of steel environment like in the plant. So um, this the graph uh, shows you about the different layers. So in Europe, uh, it's leveraging 868 megahertz uh, and also 433 megahertz. In the US is 915 megahertz. Uh, Asia is more 430, and then on top of that, you have the lower modulation, which is an FSK, and, and you have different type of uh, uh, transmit capability. Class A, which is uh, the sensor wakes up when it needs to send data, which is let you have a long battery life. Class B is more like a beacon style, and class C is continuous. Uh, if you move towards continuous, it's better to look at powering your device uh, with a local power supply. So. In terms of LoRa One for the oil and gas, this slide is more about what we expect to see. Uh, again, I mean, the Smart Industry Work Group uh, we are a member of uh, really help us uh, define for the manufacturers uh, what we expect in the oil and gas. So, of course, you have the oil and gas requirement, which has uh, always ingress protection, uh, wide operating temperature uh, range. Uh, a lot of times, minus 40 to plus 40 C. Uh, as our loose area classification, it can be at 8 x ICX, or, or, or more uh, US-based uh, environment. Um, it can be on the power side, can be battery operated or wired, support cybersecurity. Uh, the big advantage of LoRa is really it, it helps you 
put uh, have good installation, easy installation, monitoring and maintenance, and which reduce tremendously the cost in a capex and opex compared to other technologies that are more PCA wireless PCN environments such as IC100 uh, or, or others or where it's art. So uh, here are a few use cases I mentioned in that slide. Um, equipment monitoring, and it could be for any type of sensor, such as pressure, temperature, location. Uh, a lot of to do with the geolocation with personal and safety tracking, equipment tracking. Uh, remote site monitoring, because you can, uh, like for example, in Canada, there are applications where you have remote sites that are very, very difficult to, uh, uh, to find or to go to during the winter because of snow and the storms and things like that. So it's a good idea to maybe look at that technology to support that. In terms of HES, uh, you can look at uh, storm monitoring or support of the workers. Uh, again, I mean, because of its specificity, uh, it provides uh, hard to reach and uh, capability for us locations. And at the end, I mean, what it allows you to do is to create a digital twin. Now you can put sensors in the field and get a better understanding of your system and process uh, without having the, to pay as much uh, capex and opex to support those operations. So uh, a quick slide on differentiator and benefits, and I'm looking at my time. I need to hurry up a little bit. So uh, you have different options, public and private. So you can put your own infrastructure or leverage a public operator. Uh, it does firmware updates over the air. Uh, provide geolocation, it has security, we talked about it, long life in terms of battery, and uh, it can provide coverage in rural and non-cellular areas. So think about areas where you don't have any cellular coverage, then you can extend that. Of course, it's low, low data rate, and in a plants, uh, you have deep penetration. So when you look about, uh, with all those characteristics, really LoRa is, uh, LoRa one is uh, uh, the de facto standard for, for uh, low power, wide area network. So uh, I think I went a bit over my time. So I'm going to give the, uh, the floor to Robert Wall from Multitech. Hey, thanks, Philippe. Yeah, so uh, Multitech's been in the connectivity business for 50 years as of this year. And you think about communications and what were you connecting back in 50 years ago? So there's a whole lot of history here. Anyway, back uh, and manufactured in the United States, but uh, kind of starting at the top there, really where they're at in this uh, as providing the platform and the ecosystem for today's LoRa, WAN connectivity is a whole family of gateways, everything from the hospitality type business to the more industrial to rated for outdoors. Then the uh, LoRa Enterprise Network Server, of course, to be able to pull it all together. And then while Multitech doesn't make any uh, sensors uh, for monitoring, they do make the chipsets that go, go down. So you can actually do some Python programming or whatever you want to do and push in some functionality out to the edge. Go ahead. <laughs> I was wondering about that transition. So uh, anyway, so we do it. Multitech does enable uh, third party manufacturers. So when you go into, you know, when you think about traditional data creation and uh, sensor deployment, you end up with the sensors, you know, what's it gonna be? Temperature, pressure, level, flow. Then what are you gonna tie that into? Is it gonna be a DCS? Is it gonna be a small RTU? Is it gonna be a wireless IO? Then how's that gonna connect across the network? Is it gonna be, uh, you know, is it gonna be cellular? Is it gonna be a, a, a serial radio network that's been out there for a long time? Then getting that data integrated into SCADA, then getting it so it can be consumed. So into a data lake and then to the applications where it can be ingested and value can be extracted. So taking a look from the left side of the screen there where you see the sensor going up to a gateway and then into the cloud, pretty much just making, creating the data at the sensor and then injecting it so it can be consumed bypassing all the cost and labor associated and sometimes bureaucracy that goes with following that whole pyramid stat. Um, also, you see by kind of bypassing, if you're using the Purdue model, uh, skipping a few of the firewall integration components. Go ahead, Philippe, thanks. So if you have any uh, wireless sensor experience, you may think about how's this different than wireless TART? or 900 megahertz, because there's a number of really good proprietary networks out there. And the wireless heart, it can be good for, you know, with its meshing and everything, it can be good for a few hundred meters. And when you take a look at the image on the left, 
you see what might be a plant complex. So in a heavy industrial facility, you might have one gateway for each of those modules within the plant. And those are typically gonna be higher speed and a lot of times they'll be line powered. But if you take a look at the, the radius that's provided, or I guess the, the uh, diameter there of the coverage of the LP WAN in that yellow uh, piece of coverage, you see that the footprint's pretty extensive comparatively. On the right side there, though 900 megahertz, especially in North America, is touted as going, you know, being able to go a mile from the sensor to the gateway, a lot of time that's used for high speed control. So it could be used for ESD or if you're doing uh, artificial lift, well optimization, something like that. So you're going to have one network that's allocated per pad, and then you'll have multiple pads. And what we're showing there with, again, the yellow sensor network coverage is that you have just a huge area that you could cover bringing that data back to a gateway to either make it available to all the local field networks or just put it directly in the cloud. Next, please, sir. So here, this is just showing that you have a field and granted this one has really good line of sight. So you deploy your lower land gateway and you think about what are you gonna do with your network? Or are you gonna use it as a simple packet forwarder where the data just goes from the sensor to the gateway and up to the cloud? Or do you want, do you want it, um, I don't wanna say constrained, but maybe your, your company has some on-prem limitations. So you don't wanna to go to the cloud. You don't wanna keep that isolated. So you'd use something like Lens, Lower Enterprise Network Server. So we take that data and communicate it in, into an on-prem data lake and make that data available. Um, or if you're using a SCADA host like Ignition or anything else out there, you can take advantage of Spark Plug B and MQTT and do some of that self-discovery, a lot of the whole sensor rapid proliferation. So I'll start kind of starting at the bottom left there. So in, I don't want to take anything from the other guys, but there's uh, all kinds of applications going from chemical tank sensors to pressures to valve position and vibration. And uh, one of the ones there that's kind of highlighted shows a bunch of sensors at the bottom. And this thing's been really great for ease of adoption. When you take a look at this technology, a lot of time this technology is rolled out from the IT component, not the OT component. And by allowing the guys that on the OT side of the business to be able to use the sensors and transmitters that they've been using for years and they know to trust uh, and plug them into a device that can you know, propagate that LoRa signal and drop these legacy instruments onto a new type network to create that data so it can be consumed has a huge amount of value and ease of adoption. And I think that might be my last slide, Philippe. No, okay. So uh, anyway, so some considerations when you're going through this is what type of sensor is it gonna be? And Philippe, in the beginning, he talked about some of the things that impact power. Some of them are the interval or sample time and also the transmit time. Then, of course, the power that the sensor consumes itself. Then how far are you going to transmit? Then how many devices are you going to have a net on the network? And what kind of, kind of device and data density do you need to plan for? Then on your data privacy, is it going to be a cloud-based solution? Or is it going to be an on-prem solution? A lot of places there are public uh, LoRa networks that are available as well. So you can go the public route or the, the private route. And kind of the difference is when you're looking at that as a difference between central and distributed architecture on that on-prem solution, it does give you a lot of supervisory uh, capability over the whole network, um, gives you control of the security, it does keep it isolated, and sometimes allows for using that data on local process control networks. And then there's the cost model which there's a, a bunch of LoRa network servers out there, multi-taxes lens, LoRa enterprise network server. And one of the things by keeping that data on inside the network, it reduces the backhaul and cloud costs. So you don't have that data migration um, concern. And you can go ahead and go to the next one there, Philippe. That one, it might actually be the I, end. I, I think that's so it. So that will bring Kevin on. Yeah, thank you. Kevin from uh, Yokogawa. Okay, thank you. Next slide. So, uh, as, as Robert had just shared, you know, I thought it would be helpful that you know, we you know, look at an overview of you know the digital transformation that's driving you know a lot of your consideration for deploying 
technologies. <clears throat> you like lower ran and industrial internet of things, big, you know, big data, cloud-based applications. So, you know, look at the, you know, the current state, you know, um, where you know, folks are looking to have a little bit more autonomous operations in their facilities and to migrate from, you know, what might be a level zero industrial autonomy situation today towards a level five full autonomous operation, maybe, you know, five years, 10 years, you know, from now, but need to lay the groundwork to be able to do that. So IoT solutions and components, you know, allow this migration to happen from, you know, that Purdue model that Robert had also shown over on the, the right side of the screen here towards a more compressed uh, model where we have both cloud and edge based applications that are driven by inputs from smart sensors. It does simplify, you know, the, the applications a, a bit. Depending on the application, however, you know, if there's OT systems that require high availability and low latency, those might stay on premise or in an edge, you know, type of application. Maybe it's a safety instrumented system or the type of application that, you know, can't tolerate, you know, latency or potential loss of cloud connectivity. Um, while IT systems such as asset performance management might migrate, you know, to the cloud. So it's, it's going to depend on, you know, your company's um, view of, you know, what should stay on premise. Security also is a key consideration. Um, often when you're going to the cloud, you are going over a public network. So end-to-end -end encryption and security appliances, cybersecurity, you know, it becomes a, an important thing to, to look at and uh, put the right sort of mitigation systems in place. Um, some app end users, though, are applicating their SCADA, historians, and other apps in the cloud. Um, again, criticality of response is going to drive the location. Sensors and edge devices are both becoming more powerful. Um, sensors are having you know, more the powerful microcontrollers built into them. We're seeing higher speed communications than the you know, legacy 1200 baud heart type communications are just 4 to 20 milliamps with just the process variable. So this is enabling things like embedding security to the edge and embedding uh, machine learning at the edge. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. So a first step in a digital transformation journey might you know, be an assessment of your current maturity of your plants, digital transformation and autonomy. You'd look to identify key drivers and KPIs such as productivity improvements, optimization of operations efficiency and worker safety improvements so that your, your transformation efforts, your investment efforts are tied back you know, to, to your KPIs and you can see, you know, see the outcome, for example, you know, operational expense you know, reduction. Um, you look to review the gaps that you've identified in your maturity assessment. I mean, if you don't have good sensing capability or missing that, that's the place that you need to start. Um, and then develop an investment roadmap to deploy technologies such as cloud analytics, big data, artificial intelligence, intelligent sensors and devices, communications like LoRa systems, you know, et cetera. The other part to consider is, you know, leverage internal and vendor domain expertise as well. So you, you've got, you know, expertise around vibration monitoring and sensing. There's first principle expertise. Um, you know, for example, you could be looking at, you know, digital twins, um, also looking at applying first principles to, to extend asset life. And I'll get into that in some of the, the next, a couple of next slides. Uh, next slide, please. So one example, you know, of an intelligent sensor, you know, as being, you know, kind of the bedrock of digital transformation is it needs to be industrial grade, high quality, typically battery powered. Um, you know, as, as Philippe had mentioned at the beginning, and I think Robert had touched on as well. So there are a lot of commercial and consumer grade LoRa sensors out there, but you know, in the, in the industrial environment, you need to have hazardous location approvals. You need to have extended temperature operation and, you know, be able to be part of the ecosystem, you know, where you can bring that data into higher level systems. So, there are also different, you know, wireless options. We're focused, you know, here at the, the Laura, you know, Laura WAN, um, and you know, with the and there are good reasons for that. You know, I think as was covered, you know, with Robert, you know, coverage is quite good, battery life, and throughput. You have trade-offs. You also have trade-offs with technology maturity, and for good reason. Laura today is 
is the global standard for communication. Yokogawa selected it as our uh, first wireless platform, you know, based on this uh, technology assessment of LoRa versus other available wireless technologies, including, uh, you know, we have ISA 100, you had Wi-Fi, you had, you know, many options, but, you know, LoRa was the best fit. Um, but, you know, there's, there's planning, you know, and, and we came up with this sushi sensor concept where, um, you know, just like sushi, where you've got the rice and the seaweed that might be common to the various rolls, and then you've got different fillings. Uh, we have uh, separated out the, the battery and the wireless communications from the, the sensing technology. So the sensing technology could be considered, you know, the, the sushi fillings. And we've got <clears throat> temperature, pressure, three axis vibration fillings today. Um, there are others that are being, you know, developed on the roadmap for the future. And then in the top, you know, today it's it's a LoRa, you know, you know, plus the you know, the battery in there. But if there's you know changes in the in the future, evolution of LoRa technology, et cetera, we're able to you know change out the radio, the battery housing, and you know keep the sensor in this uh, uh, modular type you know concept. Um, the other thing I, I think to point out for the end users is you know the the benefits of working with LoRaWAN certified devices, interoperability. And ensured, you know, connectivity to LoRa gateways is, is something that's important, so that you don't end up, you know, trying to figure, you know, work with a sensor that has LoRa but hasn't really been tested for, you know, interoperability. So I think, you know, looking at that LoRa Alliance page and finding, you know, sensor devices that are certified can can really ease your adoption of the technology. Next slide, please. And just to give an example, you know, application utilizing, you know, some some of the LoRa sensors. Uh, with these are sushi three axis vibration plus surface temperature sensors. What you're looking at is a plot uh, of the output, uh, the, the low, the orange line at the bottom is surface temperature. The gray axis is velocity. And then the blue, the, sorry, not axis, the line, the, the blue dots are the acceleration. And then the red line is the judgment value of the machine learning to, to let you know what the asset's health it might be. So of course, if the pump stops, that would be a trigger that there might be an issue. You know, maybe it, you know, it's a run to failure situation. So you would expect the judgment to be considered quite abnormal if the if the pump isn't running. So really, what this enables, you know, from an end user perspective, is you can increase industrial autonomy quite easily by uh, and improve worker safety by replacing periodic patrols to areas that might be, you know, somewhat hazardous in a plant with continuous vibration monitoring. The other benefit is you can evolve to condition-based maintenance versus periodic or run to failure type plans and, and develop you know, a timetable to, you know, for labor and parts well in advance of when the uh, asset might fail. In this instance, you know, over two months in advance, we were able to predict that this pump might fail. So you can you know, maybe plan if somebody's on a maintenance route to, to go see that you know, pump and perform some, some service. The other benefit might be you know, tying this back into first principles and identifying the cause of the vibration that's leading to pump failure, for example, pump cavitation and adjust upstream uh, process to, to be able to prevent that. So thank you, that, that's next. Thank you. Uh, now we're gonna go to Barney who is a tech -telic. Uh Thank you so much, Philippe and uh, good morning, afternoon to everyone who's joined. Uh, I'm Barney Barneski. I uh, head up sales uh, for Tectelic in the Americas. And if you don't know, I'll just give you a quick brief introduction to who Tectelic is. We are a premier provider of LoRaWAN equipment, including both gateways and devices, as well as complete solutions. Uh, probably what we're best known for in the industry is our focus on carrier grade gateways. So we've seen a lot of adoption of our uh, products and our gateways, whether that be the 64 channel, 16 channel or eight channels with some of the uh, service providers in North America, as well as in Europe, as well as some of the larger uh, enterprises. Now, we are based in Canada, specifically in Calgary, Alberta, where you have a lot of oil and gas. So we've had the privilege to see the adoption of LoRa in the oil and gas sector firsthand. In fact, I was perusing the list of attendees, and I know some of the names because we've worked with some of you before. 
Um, and there is a number of good reasons why uh, LoRa is seeing the adoption uh, in the oil and gas sector. And as Robert already kind of set it up, I'm not going to repeat a lot of those points, but I'll repeat some of them just sort of for good repetition. So if I could have the next chart, Philippe. So uh, why is LoRaWAN ideal for oil and gas? Uh, I mean, by, by, bar none, with respect to range, it's very difficult to compete. Uh, range or link budget in RF terms is pretty much on par with what we've seen with NBIOT, right? So as a competitive technology, which can be operated in an unlicensed ISM ban, i.e. everyone has access to it, it's as good, if not better, than some of the licensed solutions and alternatives that we've seen, which makes it ideal kind of in the wide area for a lot of the solutions that have already been mentioned. So things like asset tracking, well site monitoring, pipeline corrosion monitoring, a lot of monitoring, uh, low worker safety. But with that growth of adoption that Laura has seen in the oil patch, uh, it's almost becoming a victim of its own success, specifically because it's finding itself now being deployed in environments that aren't necessarily line of sight. You'll remember some of Robert's charts, which had these very nice open wide fields. Those aren't the kinds of things I'm going to be talking about. What we're seeing now more and more is LoRa being adopted in things like batteries, compressor stations, tank farms, refineries, um, a lot of tank farms. So what is the challenge and what is the difficulty of deploying LoRa in what is traditionally the wireless heart type of environment? Remember again, Robert set it up nicely, the range very limited. Let's go to that next chart and kind of talk about the environment we're deploying in. Perfect, thank you. So uh, what makes these uh, environments difficult. Uh, first and foremost, uh, there's an abundance of concrete, steel, and a lot of objects that are basically sitting between the actual end devices and sensors and the actual gateway itself, which from an RF perspective results in a lot of scatter, fading, multipath fading, and basically all of those uh, things that degrade your signal uh, between the gateway and the device. So if you have an offsite gateway or a gateway that's say remote, removed 500 to a kilometer say away from a battery or a tank farm, you may very well find that you're being challenged by the fact that your sensor is just not getting that LoRa coverage that it needs. One way companies are getting around this is through encapsulation, right? So let's encapsulate the gateway and basically put it much closer to this environment, which is hazardous, it's a hazardous environment. Uh, where electrical things have to be encapsulated in order to prevent them from exploding. Of course, if you take an RF acid and you encapsulate it, you essentially exacerbate the RF problem that I was just talking about, right? So, so how do we go about addressing this problem and what can we do in order to get good RF flora coverage kind of in that, you know, let's call it the last mile of oil and gas, right? Again, borrowing from RF. So let's have the next chart, please. Okay, so uh, the easiest and, and simplest is to deploy the gateway on site, <laughs> right? So instead of having the gateway far away, assuming that you can even have the gateway deployed far away, which isn't always the case, especially in some of these remote Canadian locations where you have a battery and maybe you, know, you don't have the luxury of having a tower 500 meters away simply because you don't have backhaul, you don't have power at that tower, right? So you are almost forced to deploy this thing on site. Deploying it on site obviously puts you much closer to the sensors. But in order to do that, you have an electrical asset, you have to make sure that your equipment is ATEX certified, or at the very least class one Div2 Div certified to ensure that when you place it in this hazardous environment and it encounters those volatile gases, that you don't create a hazard for the workers that are at this uh, location. So that's kind of the step one. But what about all of the scatter, the multipath stuff that I was just kind of describing? Um, here is where, again, from a pure RF perspective, deploying gateways or access points with multiple antennas helps, and it can help significantly. So multiple antennas on your access points help with the multipath environment. Not only that, cavity filters also have a significant performance improvement by being able to ensure that your receiver is not desensitized. Again, remember this is operating in the ISM band, but the cellular networks which operate adjacent to that ISM band, because they're licensed, can transmit at a much higher wattage 
they can desensitize your receiver. So again, if you can filter out the noise, ensure that your receiver is not desensitized, you have multiple antennas, you can place the device much closer to your uh, sensors, you have basically created a much better solution for yourself in order to be able to reach those uh, critical uh, devices. Um, and then there's one last thing that we can do in order to improve the situation for ourselves, and that's simply to increase power of the end devices. Now, this is only applicable in North America, but if you can, within the ISM band, demonstrate that your device can channel hop over more than 50 channels, it can transmit at a full watt, which again is a significant improvement to your link budget, which means that if you have it buried in a lot of piping, you can actually crank up the transmit power on that end device provided you have a gateway that can give you more than 50 channels. And with that, next chart, please. Kind of setting this up for this punchline here. Uh, what we've done is Tectelic has essentially taken its Kona Mega Gateway. Uh, this gateway has been widely deployed by the water metering vertical, by you know folks in the uh, kind of build it and they will come verticals with respect to networks because of its huge scalability. But we've taken that gateway and we've certified it with uh, ATEX. Uh, so specifically, we've obtained a class one div two certification for it, uh, which allows us now to place this in much closer proximity to the end devices. The reason why we picked this gateway and not any of the other gateways in our portfolio is again, because of the characteristics which I just described, right? It has the 64 channels, so your end device can transmit at a full watt. It has the two antennas, which means we can handle the multi-path environment of a refinery. It has the cavity filters that allows us to ensure our receiver is not desensitized, which means that at the very end, once you have this gateway on site, you have a lot of flexibility with respect to where you place it. So if you find that you're deploying a refinery or a battery or, or basically an environment that is ex extremely RF difficult, you have now the capability of moving this gateway around the facility in order to ensure you have the best possible coverage. In essence, we're starting ourselves to go down the wireless heart path and going a little bit after that business as the end devices start to, uh, the, the portfolio of end devices starts to grow. So with that, I'll get to my last chart. Uh, so the reason why we stepped into this space uh, is uh, again, because as I already mentioned, we're working within the oil and gas uh, vertical already being based here in Alberta. There are a lot of end devices that are now coming to the market uh, that have that ATEX class one div two or class one div one certification. So Aloxy, I'm not gonna steal their thunder. They're, they're going after me. I thought they were before me. So I'm not gonna talk much about that. Uh, Steam IQ, however, not represented here. Uh, they have an ultrasonic steam trap that is now class one div two certified. And they're actually in the process of obtaining a zone two certification as well. So it's for environments that are even more stringent than the ones I was talking about. For our part, we have a couple of devices for which we are currently in the process of obtaining the uh, hazardous designations form. Uh, uh, certifications for, one being our Modbus transceiver. So this device is an IP67 temperature rated device, which is going to be very easy for us to obtain the ATEX certifications for in order to allow us to basically connect PLCs, right? So Modbus SCADA type PLCs, whether those be ASCII or RTU. And last but not least, we have this month launched a contact tracing device for uh, safe back to work type uh, contact tracing. Uh, and we are going to be obtaining a class one div two certification for this device as well. So, you know, this is uh, kind of in a nutshell of what we're doing in order to contribute to the overall oil and gas sector uh, solution space with respect to Laura. We believe we have a good solution. Obviously, if this resonates and you're interested in more details, uh, get in touch. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you, Barney. Now we're moving uh, to Frank from Anoxy. Uh, yes, hello, good uh, Good morning, good afternoon. Um, so let me start with a brief introduction. Uh, Aloxy is not in the market like, uh, like uh, Multitech for 50 years. Uh, Aloxy is actually a, a startup from Belgium um, that, uh, that has been founded by, uh, by two professors of the, of the University of Antwerp specialized in uh, low power wide area communication protocols. So uh, you could say that we are really founded uh, on the base of, uh, of this technology and, uh, and that I think makes us, uh, makes us a, a special company in this, in this area. 
so we develop uh, our solution specifically for the oil and gas and, uh, and chemical markets, which means that everything is, is, uh, is ATEX and uh, um, explosion proof uh, certified. Uh, and in combination with uh, with the with our knowledge in the in the low power uh, 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 how do you call it in the low power uh, area, we uh, we have developed several uh, solutions. Um, so next slide, please. So we have seen initially in the industry that uh, valve uh, monitoring was was something that was uh, was uh, high on everybody's agenda. Uh, so uh, valve monitoring is about monitoring manual valves and we've seen that there are thousands of manual valves in the, in the different plants and that uh, the solutions that are available today for monitoring the position of these valves um, is often quite cumbersome, expensive, um, it's wired or it operates on wireless hard or ISA 100 which altogether makes it a quite uh, costly um, solution. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can check the valve. So there are still many valves that get regularly checked by people out in the field. But again, that's very time consuming and prone to error. So for that reason, uh, our, our first product in the market was a, was a uh, low power solution for manual valve positioning. Um, next slide, please. Yes, so uh, when you look at, uh, uh, at, at this chart, you will see in the left uh, bottom that uh, you see the, in the oil and gas uh, technologies like industrial Bluetooth, wireless heart, uh, ISA 100 is in, is in there as well, uh, are all very short range, uh, which means that uh, they uh, consume a lot of battery. They are, uh, you often have a mesh uh, network, which means that all the sensors are continuously awake sending and receiving, uh, which makes them quite expensive. And on the far end of the spectrum, on the other side, you have LoRa. And that's what made, uh, uh, I think, LoRa really revolutionized uh, the industry is because with the long range and the low data rate, we were really able to make a, a low cost sensor with a small battery, still maintaining a long battery lifetime and covering a, a large area in a star topology which, uh, which, uh, which realizes uh, a very large area of, uh, of the site, which also brings down the cost of the infrastructure. Um, next slide. So when you look at uh, what we have developed is basically we have developed a sensor uh, that, uh, that is installed on the valve which communicates over LoRa1 to the gateway and then the gateway uh, communicates the, the raw data to the cloud and in the cloud we have a, an, a, what we call our IoT hub which is an important part of the of the solution and that's where uh, uh, most of the computing is done so again uh, this this IoT solutions make it possible to do this computing in the cloud um, whereby the sensor does not have to be uh, equipped with a heavy processing capacity and and again saving battery and, and saving hardware uh, on that side so uh, the, this, this technology really allows you to make a very simplistic sensor uh, and then bring all the raw data over wireless uh, communication to the cloud and then start computing uh, on the, in, in the back end uh, and then creating the connection point with the, with the customer system as we have seen in, in the earlier slides. Um, next slide, please. So if we, if we look a little bit closer at, uh, at the sensor, so the yellow box that you see in, in these pictures is our sensor. And basically it concerns of inertial sensors. So an accelerometer, a gyroscope um, that actually track the movement of the sensor. So it's one uh, fits all uh, type, meaning that you can just install it on, on any type of valve and it starts to track um, the path of, of, of opening. So the number of rotations or the, the 90 degree movement and it translates it into fully open, fully closed, but also into any intermediate uh, percentage. Um, so um, the sensor basically uh, uh, is, 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 is very simplistic, five year battery, uh, battery lifetime. And uh, as mentioned, it is really aimed to be low cost, but still used in the oil and gas environment. So it's IP69, it's ATEX, uh, FCC and FM is pending at the moment. 
Um, next slide, please. So uh, where do we see the use for this manual uh, valve operations? Uh, can we have the next slide, Philippe? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so the use case basically is, is around uh, uh, the, the manual valves uh, in, in the plant is around different areas. So one of the areas is into the process control or the day-to-day -day operation where you switch between batches and you want to know in your control system or verify in your control system what is the position of certain, uh, certain valves. Uh, a second use case that we see is uh, lockout techout isolations, which means that uh, a lot of times uh, when you do maintenance in the plant, you need to isolate it correctly, uh, but also you need to remove the isolations before you start up the plant and make sure that the valves are back in the, in the correct position. Uh, so the, the, the valve position sensor uh, adds an additional safety layer and provides that data to, uh, uh, to, to the control system to make sure that all the valves are in the, in, the, in the right position. Similarly, with lineups, before you start to move products, you want to make sure all the right valves are open so you prevent uh, cross-contamination or, or any spills. Um, so in, in lineups, similarly to batches, it's, it's really about a, a lot of switching, a lot of activities, and you just want to make sure that, you, that your manual valves are in the right position. So finally, we see a, a use case around alarming. Um, so there are a lot of critical valves that are continuously open and uh, you, you really want to know when somebody touches that valve. So it can be in a flare line or a blowdown valve uh, or an emergency shower, uh, all, all those type of, of, uh, of use cases. Um, so this is, this is really physical use cases, but we also see additional uh, um, value in tracking all of this data. And eventually when you have thousands of sensors in your plant, you, you also use the data to really uh, uh, track wear and tear, uh, et cetera. So the final slide to close it up is, uh, yeah, we, we obviously we are doing several pilots, proof of concepts we have, uh, different type of, of projects ongoing in private cloud, in public cloud, on-premise uh, solutions. So uh, yeah, the, all the types of architecture are, are available and, and running at different uh, customers in the oil and gas already as we speak. Um, so thanks, this was, uh, this was my presentation. Okay, and uh, John, uh, sorry, <laughs> we took a lot of time earlier, so. Uh, no problem, I can be quick. Am I coming through okay? Yes. All right. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, afternoon. Um, thank you for having us. Um, I wanted to kind of bring together a lot of the things you already heard in a real use case that we had uh, in the San Joaquin Valley here in California. Um, this is an image of our Kern River field. It's just north of LA, about uh, two hours. Um, we've been operating here for about a hundred years. Um, it's also where Chevron's heavy oil center of excellence is. So a lot of the technology we develop here goes around the world to uh, Ind Indonesia, the Middle East, South America. Um, so it's really a hotbed of innovation. Um, we have about 16,000 wells. Um, nearly all of them are already instrumented and have been for many decades now, actually. Um, but traditional wireless technologies have always had a high barrier to entry in terms of ruggedized, industrialized. But when you look out at this picture, and you think about everything that's going on in a field that's this complex, you know, where we're um, generating 700 megawatts of power, we have water treatment, we have roads, we have power distribution, we have tens of thousands of power lines. It actually, that, that scale is very difficult to instrument. So there's still a lot going on out there that involves uh, operator routine duties and clipboards and just repetitive tasks. And this is just one of six fields and just one business unit for Chevron. Um, so about three years ago, some of the technologists here and I started to look at what could we do to really have a paradigm shift in terms of low cost instrumentation and monitoring for lower consequence things that we were still just sending people out in trucks or using dipsticks to measure or look at hash uh, marks on a tank, um, things of that nature. And so we actually looked at uh, agriculture and smart cities and what was going on in Europe and around the world. Laura was a little bit of a, it had a little slow uptake in the US I'd say. So when we jumped in three years ago, there really wasn't much understood. Um, and so we've been on quite a, a journey in those three years to understand the technology, 
articulate it to our leadership and the operators um, and really highlight that opportunity uh, of what these um, devices could, could uh, afford us in our, our um, um, workflows. Uh, next slide. I'm on a break, so, oh, yeah, <laughs> so can, can, can you like uh, keep on going a little bit? I have 30, I 30 seconds left. I'll freestyle it. Okay. Um, so Sorry. knowing the next slide, um, you know, when you're trying to frame an idea, like I just love talking to pictures anyway. So when you're trying to frame a big idea like this, you know, you heard about the really great technology and RF characteristics from Philippe and the devices and all of that. But the story that we needed to tell was, you know, what could you do in a field like this if you know you had these characteristics of if you had a five mile range, five year battery life, and you could get a device in the field for five hundred dollars, what would that do to your workflows? How could you transform how you do chemical management, how you do asset tracking, and that's a paradigm shift for oil and gas. Those numbers are actually fairly conservative. We saw range tests over twenty miles, uh, and this is what our, our coverage map looks like. That whole field you saw in that picture is just a tiny that that right side of the map. That that's what we can cover now. So we have six fields across California all, all covered and we were able to deploy that network in six months. But yeah, those forcing functions of what could you do if you had devices with these characteristics in an environment like this, the, the opportunities really started to, to unfold pretty quickly. Um, part of that learning journey in over three years was you know, the diverse ecosystem that you know, some of the representatives are here uh, between gateway providers, network server providers, device manufacturers, cloud vendors, um, um, that was a lot to uh, kind of navigate in a nascent uh, technology. Uh, and so similar to some of the imagery that Kevin and Robert provided around OT and IT converging, of course, and then this idea of kind of more open paths of communication from the field to the person making decisions or analyzing the equipment or the, the workflow or the supply chain. You know, Chevron went on a similar kind of evolution to where we could have that direct path to the cloud for lower consequence measurements, these open SCADA concepts, we call it our open data architecture. But if it's low consequence and it's data uh, ingest only, you know, we have new options at the table to, to get that data. And so that had to, we had to get through the political components and then we got through the technology and everything else. And so, um, you know, some, some of the thinking we have is on that slide. I won't go through all of it, but one of the big ones was just this idea of what if you could think of devices as more as a consumable rather than an asset? You go into the stock warehouse and you have, here's your pressure sensors, here's your temperature sensors, here's your tank monitors. And if they only cost a few hundred bucks, you don't manage it like an asset anymore. If it fails, an operator can just simply rapidly redeploy and you're not sending out a, a work order. That really changes the equation in terms of OPEX. Uh, and so the last slide, I'll just share kind of our, our primary, you know, our big use case that we just finished rolling out last year in the San Joaquin Valley, and that was our chemical management program. And many of you probably are familiar with chemical management uh, programs and, and, and well treatments. With heavy oil, we have thousands of these 250 gallon totes all over those fields. Uh, and what they're doing is they're dosing, um, you know, emulsifiers or uh, anti-corrosion uh, uh, to the well bore. Uh, the, uh, the emulsifier is helpful for cold weather like we have right now where we'll have those lines and they'll plug. So if you have a tank that runs dry, you'll have lost production because those lines will clog and you gotta blow them back with steam. So thousands of tanks, traditionally you were using dipsticks or looking at those hash marks and recording them and you maybe get a measurement every two weeks. Um, traditional instrumentation, they actually gave it a go using pressure transducers, but they would fail and they never get prioritized to get fixed because uh, you needed an engineer and an electrician. So what we did is if you look at that little node on the top of the lid is we just simply put an ultrasonic device in there with a LoRa radio and a battery, uh, a few hundred bucks. And to redeploy, it's a matter of using your cell phone, pair it to the network, screw on the lid, and you have a new measurement device installed in a matter of minutes. That's an order of magnitude cheaper and faster than traditional instrumentation. Again, these are use cases where we were getting a measurement every two weeks. Now we're getting it every hour. We didn't need it every few minutes, every second. That was overkill for what we do. But this space here where it's like, you just need that periodic once a day, once an hour measurement, and you have a device that can last for five years and just, if it does break, it's a non-event. That was what we were really going after. So we got 30 gateways out in about six months. We got 3000 sensors out in about a year, the same year. And we uh, essentially had hundred percent return on our investment in the first year and we're still now kind of moving through, you know, what are the next opportunities we have around vibration? 
temperature and you know working with this group here in the smart uh, industry working group within the Laurel Alliance because the device space is still nascent you have like really brilliant startups like Aloxy all the way to you know proven industrial players like Yokogawa and everything in between so our role is you know we want to be part of that ecosystem as it continues to emerge and kind of you know unlock more of these use cases like the one I just uh, shared here. Thank you, John. So uh, quickly, uh, before we go to Q&A, uh, if you go to the uh, LoRa website, you're going to go and you can see all the verticals we're working with. And, and I really encourage you guys to go and, and check it out. There are, there are a lot of very good information. So um, uh, really, I mean, that's LoRaAlliance.org. Uh, and that's where you can get access to all that information. So uh, it's time for Q&A. I, I saw that there are uh, some question and answer coming. Uh, in the Q&A section. I seen uh, some of them were already answered. Uh, the first one, I think that it will be a question for Jackie because I don't know it's between energy now. Um, uh, will we get the presentation by mail? Uh, yes, we have a recording. We can also uh, provide the slides. Okay, very good. Uh, the second one, so I'm gonna try to see. I don't know which one came first. So I think it was always a reliability of LoRa systems. Are there examples of this being used in mission critical or safety system? So anybody from the, any panelists want to tackle this one? Oh, Dan. Okay. I think somebody answered already, so. Uh, I don't know who answered it, but. It shows on other answer. Uh, the next question is, can battery of these devices be replaced online? Uh, maybe I can answer that. At least for, for our sensors, uh, it's, uh, the, the, the battery itself cannot be replaced in an in, in, uh, uh, explosion-proof area. So you need to take the sensor out of the explosion-proof area to replace the battery. Uh, but it does uh, come with a very simple slide off mechanism where you, yeah, in, in a matter of 30 seconds, remove the sensor uh, and, and uh, change the battery. But you need to do it outside of the explosion proof area. I'll add a little okay. more color. One of the things we're excited about and where this technology could be moving is uh, it, it's a, a, a good fit with energy harvesting. One of the things we did was we harvested energy from the steam pipe, the heat to actually have a self-powered device. Because when you're talking about thousands or tens of thousands of devices, battery changes are just gonna be a problem operationally at scale. So we're really interested in seeing where, you know, solar energy, kinetic energy harvesting can become a, a fit for these low power devices. Okay, so uh, we're gonna go back to the first question because I, when I click answer live, it, it took it as an answer. So again, let's go back. How is the reliability of LoRa systems? Are there examples of this being used in mission critical or safety systems? Hey, Philippe, Robert here. Not being an operator, I'll just give my two cents, but um, though the reliability and uh, consistency is high, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider it in a, a, SIL, a SIL level safety system at all. Yeah, and I give the same feedback. We would, I mean, we would not use it in a mission critical system. Uh, okay. Next question, uh, Laura One is undoubtedly a very important legal piece in the IoT architecture. However, just wondering how you, from your industry perspective, see it coexist and interplay with the rollout of 5G? I'll jump on this one unless somebody else wants it. <laughs> so uh, on, on the 5G, we currently, uh, preparations are being made to roll out 5G inside the multi-tech gateways. Um, there are two different components to 5G. There's the up to six gigahertz, and then the, I think above 28 gigahertz, which is the millimeter bandwidth. And one of the issues there with both of those is going to be the range of it, and it's going to be the power. I see them working uh, complementary with each other. I don't see them. Uh, I don't see it being a competing technology. Very good answer. Thank you. Uh, we are at, at the end. I mean, Jackie, is it okay if we uh, answer a few uh, questions left or? Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay. I have a couple of questions in the chat too um, there at the end, Phil. Okay. So the next one is uh, to achieve the ranges in San Joaquin Valley, do you have line of sight from Gateway to Samsa? I think it's for John. Yeah, I would say that when we hit that 20 mile plus shot, that was definitely line of sight with a tower mount on a, on a mountain. So that was ideal conditions. But I'd say that our environment is something similar to what Barney described, where it's not that open field like Robert has, but we also have a lot of wells, a lot of dense tanks. So there's a lot going on there. So we're somewhere in the middle in terms of the complexity of our terrain with the with the hills and everything. But, you know, in the, the two to five mile range, five mile probably being the upper end is 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 reasonable. Hey, John, I, I think it's also important to point out that you guys have in the neighborhood of 14,000 uh, radios out there. It, yeah, the RF is, there's a lot going on, plus with our neighboring operators. Okay, thank you, guys. Next question, are there any use cases on petrol station tank monitoring or oil and gas tankers? For, for the petrol stations, yes, there are there are some sensors that are available and rate, rated accordingly. Everything from the the in ground tank sensors to the LPG that are using the Rochester top uh, style gauge adapters. Uh, yeah, shipping is a really interesting one. Um, we do know that the cargo, because again, I like to look at the adjacent verticals, but shipping and cargo shipping has really moved to adopt this technology because you can put a gateway on a boat, cover the whole boat. It's pretty simple. Yep. Good feedback. Thank you. Next question. Do you know satellite LoRaWAN constellation being used in commercial operation? If yes, what countries and companies provide such a device? I don't have anything for this one. <laughs> oh, so oh, this is Kevin. It, it might be referring to backhaul of the LoRa, because the LoRa, of course, would be a local area network. So it could be, you know, it's just a matter of you having satellite or cellular for backhaul to, to the cloud. So, so I, I can answer, yeah. There is a few companies doing store and forward, and they use satellite. Uh, because the LEO satellite constellation has only one very big player uh, running right now. And they are more looking at uh, uh, high throughput technology. Uh, but there are a few smaller companies that do store and forward. So uh, they don't have as many uh, satellites in space but they can uh, help you get that data. And the next time it pass over the, uh, uh, the Earth station, it would give it back to you. Yeah. Um, so something to add, Philippe, maybe is to watch what this, the Starlink uh, yeah. coverage is starting to become more widespread from the Northern latitudes now, which could provide some other options, lower cost, lower latency mm -hmm. options. The Leo backhaul is, is, is a great option and is available now. I would say that there is a bleeding edge concept from a company called Lacuna, which is actually native LoRa from a satellite um, directly from a device featuring the same low power characteristics straight to space. Um, again, that's bleeding edge kind of startup world, but it's interesting what they're thinking. Yep. Do any of the presenters have experience installing an asset tracking solution on drilling rigs and what equipment was used? Actually, I can uh, add a little bit of context to that one. So we actually have been testing this device here. It's our industrial GPS asset tracker. It was really designed literally with the oil and gas sector in mind, right? It's an IP67 device. Again, we have it Slater for ATEC certification. It comes with two large D cell batteries. It receives GPS coordinates as well as can listen to Bluetooth. Um, so yeah, very ruggedized, obviously temperature rated. The idea was to be able to track unpowered assets that get left in the field, right? Spring thaw comes in, you leave the lease. Where do you find it afterwards? Maybe do you have staff turnover? People don't always keep good track of their assets. Yeah, we've part. done that as well in Canada for some of our tower, uh, tower traders. So, yeah. Uh, what about LT uh, narrowband? It was claimed as better LoRa managed by professional network providers. I'm probably not the best one to take it. So if somebody else wants it, have at it. But my, uh, my, my experience in the, that component is uh, one of the issues is that you can go stand up a LoRa network right away amongst your infrastructure. Whereas with uh, narrowband IoT, um, you have to have a carrier out there. You have to have a provider or you have to be willing to make a big commitment to stand up your own. Whereas LoRa, you can, you can receive a box from uh, out of 
you know, from UPS or FedEx and open it up. And a few hours later, you have a network operating. Yeah, if I could add to that, Robert. Uh, so one of the strengths, especially in the uh, oil and gas sector that we've seen here, quite often what we'll hear from the field is, you know, Telus doesn't want to put a tower there or it does, it's not cost effective for them to add coverage because it's oh so far away. So you have this, you know, cottage industry of guys running around with repeaters, cellular repeaters, trying to augment a carrier signal. It's nonsense. It doesn't scale and it's extremely difficult. To Robert's point, go buy a gateway, put it wherever you want and you have coverage, right? So that's the real key and the simplicity and flexibility of LoRa compared to NVIOT in this application. Thank you, guys. Last question. Are you aware about uh, NBIoT threats of LoRaWAN? Well, I think it's in the same line. Yeah. NB, NBIoT is definitely afraid of LoRaWAN, I would say. <laughs> so you're saying the other way around. OK. Yeah. <laughs> Good play, Barney. <laughs> OK, so uh, I think that's it. There's no more questions. Thank you, guys, for staying with us. I really appreciate Lots of good uh, information from our panelists and lots of good questions. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Energy Now, for hosting us today. Thank you very thank much. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.